I'm Juliette Sear, a working mum of three whose love affair with baking started 20 years ago with some rather dodgy cake to my children's birthdays. But that was then. This is now. Baking is pretty much my life. Just be really creative, there's no right or wrong. <laughs> <laughs> From celebration cakes to afternoon teas, I've tackled everything baking can throw at me. From dodgy blenders, <laughs> fighting with the uh, food processor as usual, to some seriously stubborn cake tins. It's really slippery. <laughs> <laughs> Help me. <laughs> so now it's time to share everything I've learned with you. Anything is possible. From classic comfort food, to the latest trends, there's wow factor for any occasion, be it Christmas, birthdays, or beyond. And if that wasn't enough, I'm baking sensational savoury dishes too. Get ready for tasty tarts, perfect pasta, and lovingly handcrafted pies, plus some incredible plant-based delights too. To top it all off, I'm catching up with some of my mates and special guests who've all made their flowery mark on the world of baking. Plus, we'll hear from the experts behind some of our favourite treats and learn the secret to some pretty epic creations. So grab yourself a cuppa and get ready for some seriously beautiful baking. Today's beautiful baking menu is designed for the ultimate New Year's Eve party. There are these fantastic cake tails, combining gorgeous sponge with espresso martinis. I'm joined by Chef Marylise Parker for her savoury canapé selection of filled baby jackets and cute parmesan baskets. I've got beautifully chocolatey ganache tartlets, sure to impress all your party guests. And don't worry, I haven't forgotten the fizz. I'm off to a British vineyard to sample some homegrown sparkling wine. And for my grand finale, a massive sparkling wine drip cake that's sure to round the year off with a bang. If you take your favourite cake and a bottle of your favourite tipple, what do you get? A cake tail, of course, and that's the first thing I'm going to make for my New Year's Eve party. And I'm serving it in one of these. I'm starting off with baking a delicious chocolate sponge. So I'm going to use some light brown muscovado sugar and some softened butter. And of course, a lovely generous slug of vanilla. So I'm just gonna mix it on slow to start with. Now this cake tail is inspired by my favorite cocktail, which is an espresso martini. And you just have to try it, it's delicious. So that's all combined. I'm gonna whack up the speed. I feel like I need to have a mixer dance at this point, just pass the time. It's New Year after all. So that's nice and fluffy now. It's much lighter in colour. So the next thing to add is my eggs. So just add them in just slowly. And I'm doing it gradually just because it's much easier to mix it in like that rather than rushing it because it can sometimes curdle. That's all mixed in. So lastly, a couple of egg yolks. It's a good dessert. People won't believe it when they see it because they think it's an actual cake tail. Cocktail. With the mixer still going, I'm gonna add some lovely dark melted chocolate. And it looks incredible. I can see it all swirling around like a lovely chocolatey pinwheel. So that's all mixed in. Next ingredient, lots of lovely sour cream. It's gonna give it a bit of a savory tang. I think it goes really well with chocolate. I'm using full fat, I like the high fat content. So that's all mixed. So lastly for the dry ingredients, I'm adding some cocoa powder to some self-raising flour. I'm just gonna tip that in. And I'll just give this a gentle mix through just to distribute it evenly, just to make sure there's no lumps of cocoa in the final baked sponge. So I'll just put half in, mix it and then add the other half, just on slow. 
I don't want to over mix it, otherwise the sponge will become chewy and heavy. And I'm just looking until I can see that all the powder's disappeared, and then I'll stop the mixer. Second half. Quick mix. Perfect. So I can see that all of the powderiness has disappeared, and I'll just bring that last bit together with a spatula, just so it's not over mixing that flour. So I'm going to use this tin to bake it in, so I'm going to make a nice flat sheet cake. And because it's quite thin, you don't need to bake it for very long. Level it all out. It smells incredible. Now I'm going to bake this in the oven on 180 degrees for about 20 to 25 minutes. And while that's baking, I can get ready with my soaking syrup. My chocolate cake is all baked and cooled down. It's super fudgy, so now it's time for cake tail action. So I've got some strong espresso. And to that, I'm going to add a couple of tablespoons of sugar. And just give it a stir until the sugar has dissolved. So I don't even need to bother using a saucepan to heat this up. It will literally just dissolve into that coffee. So it's a really easy syrup. The great thing about this idea for parties is you can get all of the cake baked and you can even get the cakes into the glasses and then do the topping at the last minute. So a nice double shot of vanilla vodka and two doubles of coffee liqueur. So it sounds like a lot, but this is between four people. And it's New Year's Eve. There we go. So that's all ready to soak all over the sponge. So when I put it in the glass, it's going to look like that classic espresso martini. You've got the very dark part in the major part of the glass. It's a big chocolatey V. And then on the top, you've got that light beige foam. And I'm going to create that with some mascarpone and some icing sugar. Just mix it together. I'm just going to beat it quite vigorously to get rid of any sugary lumps to make it smooth. And you can see it's quite creamy and almost a bit runny now. But I want it to be more liquid and just have that hint of kind of caramel colour. So for that, a little bit more coffee liqueur. Tablespoon or so until you get the right colour and the right consistency. So now it's time for the fun bit. I'm going to put it all together. And I'm just going to cut four circles out. I once had to make 400 of these, you know. <laughs> there we go. So I'm just going to take a little bit of this, crumble it in. So what I'm going to do now is soak this first layer with a little bit of my syrup. Let's pour this into a jug, it's the easiest way. I made a mess and I didn't even have any cake tails. <laughs> I'm just going to take a little spoon and just push it down. And now just add a bit more of that crumbled sponge. I'm going to pop in my cut pieces of cake. I'm just going to push it down and then soak with some more syrup and then give it another final push. Now, looking at these, I can see here that it's still not quite touching the glass. So what I do now is just take a small spoon and really press around the edge. Make sure you've got a nice clean rim before your party. <laughs> now for the topping. Put a few spoons in the middle. So once I've got it, so it's almost to the edge. I'm just going to tap it gently on the surface like this until all of that sponge is covered. And look at that. It's looking brilliant already. Just topping off the last one. So now just a gentle tap just to settle the top. They look perfect. So, of course, the final thing, what do you need on the perfect espresso martini? Some coffee beans. I've got some chocolate ones here. And I like to have like three on the top. That's the classic. So just pop these on. I think they look perfect. So that is how you turn your favorite cocktail into a cake. Here's to a brilliant new year. I'm going in. You can't beat it. Today, I'm 
joined by Chef Merrilise Parker, who knows all about catering for a crowd. She's catered for royalty, Grand Slam tennis players, and even a huge Indian wedding. So, Merrilise, where do you start when you're planning food for a huge New Year's Eve party? Well, always have stuff you can do in advance. Um, a few last minute things, maybe some hot items. A few things are gonna be ready when your guests arrive that look fab, because I'm big on presentation. A little bit like this item I have here. Incredible. So we've got Bloody Mary shots in shot glasses, and they could be poured before your guests arrive. And then we've got cheese straws. Again, they could be made in advance. I like that. I love to get ahead and just think, I want to be spending all the time with my guests enjoying the party, not slave, exactly. slaving away in the kitchen. Exactly, and also particularly something like New Year's Eve. You've got to remember it's a very social event. Yeah, so be up with a the mingle menu perfect we have kind of here. Oh, do you know, I'm really excited to see what you've got here because I'm loving these. So what have you got so for me here? So this is a super simple thing to do. So these are baby potatoes which have just been cooked until they're just soft on the inside. And then when they're cool enough to handle, you cut them in half and you just scoop out the inside and... I wouldn't waste this in the bowl. I've turned that into little mini fish cakes. And the great thing about this recipe is you can take them to this stage a few days beforehand and you can keep them for a couple of days covered in the fridge or you can even freeze them at this stage. So we're just going to brush with a little bit of olive oil because we want the potatoes to be crispy but not super soggy and drenched. That's the last one. Perfect. Now I normally just sprinkle a little bit of salt just over the... Mm. Yummy. Yum. Right, so they're going to go into an oven. So what are we going to put in ours today? Yeah, well, I'm going to make two of my favourite things. I'm going to make mackerel pate. This is normal mackerel that you buy from the supermarket, which I've just taken the bloodline out of and I've flaked. Now, I know you don't eat fish, but interestingly, with mackerel, it's quite a party pleaser. Like, my kids will eat mackerel pate, but they might not eat other fish. So this is really good, and it's also really reasonably priced. So to that, I'm going to add some... Smell that. Grated horseradish. Great horseradish is one of my favourite things is in the entire world. Oh, yeah. I love it. Yeah. Me too. Now, it, it, this is not an absolute necessity. It's still delicious, mm. just with lemon yes, and all the other bits I'm going to add. More Cream well. cheese needs to be full fat. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not a believer in any low fat. I mean, it's I... a New Year's Eve party. Exactly. We're Come not on, like counting calories. No, we're not. Having That's all January. the calories. No, this is the full fat version. So cream cheese, and then I've got some lovely herbs. Dill is great, parsley is great, chives is great. So I'm going to put a little bit of um, everything in there. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to have a little squeeze of lemon juice, like that. I'm not going to season this at the moment, add salt, because the fish in the smoking process will be quite salty. Um, and we've put some salt in our potatoes as well. So I knew it would be great having you around because you're going to have all the top tips. Because, of course, you're used to catering for thousands of people, so you've got to find these quick ways, haven't Definitely. you? Definitely. That... Um, I'm just going to have a little taste of this. Mm. Tiny bit of salt and a little bit of pepper. Yes, I mean, I've done some really big events. I mean, the, the Indian weddings, they're for 2,000, 3,000 people. Goodness me. I mean, they really... And all of it is buffet, interestingly. So presentation to them is absolutely everything. They don't ever sit down at any of those kind of events and have a sit-down meal. Right, now, this is a tr good trick. Disposable piping bag. Yeah. You need to fold it right down like that and then push it in. Do you do that spinning trick? I do. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> Watch this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can we explain why we do that? Yeah, go OK, on. so we do that to get all the air out. So that means, as you can see... That's just ready to go, ready, ready to, to inject go. into your crunchy exactly. potatoes. So I'm Bad. going to just put that aside, and now I'm going Shall to make... I dump this in the, Thank in you the very sink. much, that'd be great. So now for my second filling, which is vegetarian, um, and I love beetroot. And the great thing about cooked beetroot is it's really easy to chop small. And then I've just dressed that with a, um, a little bit of olive oil and a tiny bit of wonderful pomegranate molasses. Oh, lovely, it's yes. It's delicious, I love isn't it? It's really mm. nice. You could use honey, you could use aged balsamic. I'm just going to put a tiny drizzle of olive oil. Now, whipped feta. Sort of, it's like a sort of feta and yogurt mm, mix. I've never tried that before. You never? No. Oh my god, it's so easy. I love feta. So a little bit of yogurt. Okay. Full fat strained yogurt. I've got a few chives here. I'm just going to sprinkle them in. Okay, I'm just add a little squeeze of lemon juice. So again. Gonna get out our piping bag. <laughs> this also could be made in advance. So we're gonna go for the spinning. Yeah, the spinning. Yeah. <laughs> I did this once and I forgot that I had a, a nozzle in it and all Just my butter went flying. Imagine <laughs> if that had exploded. At least it wasn't the fish one. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, there we go. And that's all good to go. And then you just, I'm going to tie that in the end. And that's how you keep it in them. So that's your vegetarian filling, ready to go for your okay, potatoes. So now let's get our potatoes. So I love this, Merrilies. I've noticed you've got your lovely festive display yeah. going on underneath there. Half the thing is presentation for yeah. sure. So I've just snipped the end off the whipped feta and you just put a little bit of that in and then you top with beetroot like that and finish with a little sprinkling of herb. They look really pretty. Should I do the herbs while you're oh, doing thank the filling? You very much. I do love a bit of teamwork. Oh, I love a bit of teamwork. Especially at a party. A little bit of herb on those two. What, without the beetroot? Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Should we do that again? <laughs> those are for the people that don't like beetroot. Yeah, because you, you know, some, it is a There's bit a of love and of, hate. Yeah, Auntie some... Dottie, she's always said to me, <laughs> I'll never eat Leave some them. without beetroot for her. <laughs> Don't you find, I mean, it is fun, like, getting your friends around to help you sort of assemble, but there's some people that you just don't want in the kitchen, isn't oh there? Some goodness. people are like, yeah, no, I'm fine. <laughs> my dad, normally leaning against the fridge. Yeah, my dad's the same. Helping himself to the white wine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to do a few mackerel now. Gorgeous. And then should we just sprinkle a bit of herbs? A bit of some nice herbs. Lovely. Bit. And you've got some herbs there. Yeah, should I just sprinkle them all over? Sprinkle just to, just to dress. There Fabulous, that go. looks amazing. I shall clear away. I shall be your sous chef ready for the next thing. Thank you. What are we making next? OK, now we're going to make Parmesan baskets and we're going to put a little mini Caesar salad inside. OK. Baking sheet covered with baking paper. And then I've got a little cutter here and I'm going to fill the cutter. You need about five grams of Parmesan. Per basket. You, per, per little basket. And you just want to sprinkle around the edges here, press it down very, very gently, and then you move on and you do another one. So they go into the oven at about 175, and you need to keep an eye on them because if you don't leave them in long enough, they're too molten to lift and to mould them. And if you leave them in for too long, they burn and then they don't taste very nice. Right. OK, there we go. So could you do this in advance, for example, have... And have them in the fridge, yeah, I think you probably could. As long as you bring the tray up to room temperature before you put it in the oven, right, okay. I would say. Take them out of the oven when they're this colour and they'll be flat and you leave them for about 30 seconds to a minute and you want to be able to lift them up, just like you would with a twill biscuit, and then you just push the bottoms down, and then you end up with a lovely basket. Look at them. They're brilliant. I mean, that's such a perfect idea. You can fill this with so many things, I guess. Definitely, definitely. And then they're we're brilliant. going to fill them with our Caesar salad. So we've got some... I've used baby gem for this. Super finely shredded, mm. because you've obviously got to lift it into the basket. Yeah. Um, and then I've made some Caesar dressing. Now, I've made this with anchovies. I know that you don't eat fish, so it'd be really easy to keep there. You're just trying to keep them all for yourself, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> so even just garlic mayonnaise would be delicious for this. Tiny little bit of pepper. I'm not going to add salt because the anchovies are in there, but I would probably add some flaked sea salt if I wasn't using anchovies. Mm. Right, so the important thing here is to put them onto presentation plates before you fill them. So if you could grab me... Yeah, oh, I've got a perfect one here. Oh, my little display here. Oh, look at this. There we go. So now great. I'm going to take a small teaspoon, and if you could follow me with the croutons. We've made some croutons here. Yeah. Super baby, because you just want that little bit of crunch on yes. the top. You've got double crunch action. I know, double crunch and, action. And one of your five a day. Yeah. <laughs> the lettuce, yeah. yeah. So there's the last one. Perfect. I shall have my last few <laughs> mini crunchy croutons. They are brilliant. I'm going to push those over there with the rest of your incredible display. Our festive feast. Look at that. So we've got our Bloody Mary shots on the glass mirror with the cheese straws and the crunchy potatoes with the whipped feta and the beetroot and the mackerel pate and then the cutest ever little Caesar salads. <laughs> They are really brilliant. Thank you so much, Marilise, for My coming pleasure. to show me all that. I feel really inspired. I'm sure everyone's going to feel inspired at home and be getting ready for the party. Let's get the party Happy started. Happy New Year! Where's the champagne? Where's the champagne? Excuse me, champagne. <laughs> Now, one thing guaranteed to get all of your guests talking about your New Year's Eve spread 
is a plate full of my chocolate ganache tarts. They are to die for. I'm starting off with a short crust pastry. It's a sweet short crust. So in my processor, I've got some flour, icing sugar, and a bit of salt. It's the little blitz. I'm going to add some ice cold cubed butter. The reason it's ice cold and it's cubed is because I want to create a breadcrumb texture. And if it was soft, it would just go into a paste. I want it to be light and flaky. So I'm going to blitz this until it becomes nice and fine breadcrumb consistency. And there you go, it looks just like breadcrumbs. So the last ingredient to add, two egg yolks. I'm just going to blitz it until it becomes a ball. And you can see the pieces are getting bigger. There. As soon as it comes together into a ball, Stop the processor. I don't want to over-process it, otherwise my pastry will be tough. So I'm just going to uh, wrestle with my... There we go. So I'll just pop this on the surface. And this is a lovely pastry. It's quite sticky. It's rich, it's buttery. So just gently bring it together until I've got all the crumbly bits. So just give a nice light dusting of flour so it doesn't stick to the surface. So I'm just going to roll this out fairly thinly, because they're only tiny. I don't want a really thick wedge of pastry. So a lot of people that know me know me as a serial party hoster. The more people, the better. The biggest one I've ever thrown is for 150 at my own house, so I was quite proud of that. I'm going to cut out some little pastry discs. Right, so I'm going to line up my mini tartlet tins. Just get a palette knife just underneath. You can see it's very thin. Pop it over my miniature case and just press them in. And if they tear, it's not a problem. You can just patch them up. Any excess, I could just take my mini pin, just roll it across the top. So I've got some little pieces of parchment. I'm just give them a scrunch up. And just pop them into the cases. So just get my rice. So this is going to help the parchment to stay on the bottom of the case and up the sides so it keeps its shape. So I'm going to fit it right to the top. So I'm going to get all of these done. And when that's ready, I'm going to put it in the oven and blind bake it. And that means just to cook it part way through, eight to ten minutes till they're nice and crisp. I'll take the paper out and then give it another five to ten minutes until they're lovely and golden. I want them cooked completely because that's the last time they're going to be baked and then they're going to be filled with ganache. cases are all cooked and they've been cooled. Look at those. They're a lovely, crispy, biscuity shell, so they're ready to fill. I'm making a ganache, and ganache is just cream and chocolate, and I'm using milk chocolate. I love milk chocolate ganache, and with the sea salt, it is heavenly. I've got some double cream boiling here. So it's just come to a boil. It's just bubbling. You don't want to scorch it, so now it's time to pour over. So I'm just going to pour it all over the chocolate. And I like to just pop a plate on. And I've done that because I want the cream to gently melt the chocolate before I stir it. It just needs a couple of minutes before I bring it together with a spoon. So just let it sit two to three minutes. It's only a small amount of ganache. This is perfect with the sea salt as well. With the crisp pastry, it is divine. So I think that's ready. And to bring a ganache together, to stop it splitting, top tip, just pop your spoon in and just stir it in the center. And that's drawing in the cream and creating a lovely chocolatey cyclone. And this is a way to stop it splitting. And there you go, that's it. It's smooth, it is liquid heaven. So to this, I'm going to add a nice teaspoon of sea salt. Salt and chocolate, perfect combination. Just really a marriage made in heaven. So I'm going to put it into a jug so it's easier for me to fill my cases because they are rather tiny. So 
So now I'm just going to pour it into the tart cases. Gorgeous. Very tempted to just stand under this jug and pour it in, but I'll wait for later. <laughs> so they're not set yet. They're very liquid. If I tried to decorate them now, a lot of the decorations would just sink in. So they need to be set in the fridge. So I'll set them for about an hour minimum, but you could do this the day before New Year's Eve. My ganache tartlets have all set nicely. So now it's just time to add a little bit of sparkle for my New Year's Eve party. So I'm using some little bunches of red currants and they look lovely when you spray them with a little bit of edible gold luster. And it just makes them twinkle. And they look lovely. <laughs> my pump's jammed up. <laughs> Here we go, give it a bang. I should do it. There it goes. Look at that. Now I'm going to use some gold leaf. I love using edible gold leaf. You don't need a lot of it, just a tiny shard is all you need. And it really adds a magic sparkly touch to any New Year's Eve. And I like to leave them a bit 3D so they're kind of standing up a bit and the light hits them from every angle. So I've got one last bit of gold leaf. I might as well use the whole sheet up. Get this last nice big piece here. They look brilliant. And there are my chocolate ganache tartlets. They're going to disappear the moment they hit the table, so make sure you've got plenty. Now, one thing you're going to need for your New Year's celebrations is bubbles. I'm off to Surrey with a spring in my step to sample some homegrown sparkling. to traditional wine country, you might imagine lush French vineyards, rolling Tuscan hills, or the sun-kissed valleys of Napa. But when it comes to discovering great vino, it might be closer than you think. There are now over 700 vineyards in the UK which produce wines of all varieties. I've come to Denby's Wine Estate in Surrey to find out how a farmer starts an award-winning wine business. So, Chris, a lot of people wouldn't automatically think of vineyards being in the UK. How well, did this all happen? Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. I mean, 30 odd years ago, there wasn't even a vineyard here. It used to be a pig and cattle farm when my father bought the estate. Um, but then very quickly, he realised the potential which lay in the soil. It was pointed out to him that basically millions of years ago, when the continent was joined, the north and south downs of southern England was joined to the Champagne region of France. So it's ideal for producing premium sparkling wines. Oh, really? I imagine you every morning getting your shoes off and, <laughs> and making the wine yourself. So I'm fascinated yeah, to see well, the whole there's process. There's still a lot of uh, parts of the traditional methods we still employ. We don't tread the grapes by, uh, by, by, by using our feet anymore. Um, but, uh, you know, there are a lot of traditional methods we do use and um, that's what makes it exciting. You don't just produce one type of grape here, do you? That's right. We've got about uh, 15 different varieties here. Um, some red grapes, some white grapes, um, and we use them for all different sorts of styles of wine later on in the process. Oh, OK. So what, yeah, I don't always think about red wine being something that you produce in the UK just because of the weather, but you are actually producing good red wines now. Absolutely. It can be more challenging. We do blend some of our reds to make a really good quality red wine every year. Please, 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 can I have some of your wine? Absolutely. I've got some red here for you to go with some cheese. Brilliant. This is um, our Redlands. I've just got the best job in the world, haven't I, I think? <laughs> uh, I think mine's just as good, I, I think. I reckon, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, this is a blend. It's got Pinot Noir in it. Um, it's also got a variety called Rondo. Um, but um, I think you'll agree that it's really quite good, and especially good with cheese. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. Oh, that's really delicious. How many different varieties of wine do you produce? We have 15 different varieties of grapes and we produce about 10 different white, uh, wines from that. Um, everything from sparkling to rosés and red wines, but, you know, uh, the flagship are our sparkling wines. And I understand that you use the same process that they use for creating champagne? Absolutely. We use the traditional methods of producing it and uh, for some of our wines we use exactly the same grapes as well. Obviously, our blend's always a bit of a secret, but um, yeah, it's, it's a very um, exciting process and um, uh, after three or four years, once it's been in bottle for that long, um, the, uh, the rules are really worth it. Fantastic. Can you show me how it's all done? Absolutely. Let's go to the winery and I'll show you how the sparkling wine is made. We'll go soon because before I have too much <laughs> of this, shall we? Absolutely. We might be tripping over everywhere. <laughs> so, this is where it all happens. 
But this is brilliant. It's it like is. Willy Wonka's chocolate factory for wine. It is. I mean, again, it's been in there for three years, so this is the end result. So um, it's, it's quite unique what happens here, and it's quite exciting. So the first, first part of the process of getting that yeast out of the bottle, we have to freeze the neck. And what that does, that creates a, like a, a nice plug. The, the neck here has been sitting in glycol, so you can see there where it's all frosted up. That is a nice little ice plug there. Yeah. Um, so what we need to do now is pop that crown cap off and extract the yeast. Will I be able to see it, see it being popped out? Yes, you can. So what we do now, we have to wash that bit of glycol off there yeah. and then put it through the next part of the process. OK. Well, is this the machine that does the popping? That's right. This is the disgorging machine. Disgorging? Is that what it's called? That's the uh, technical term for taking the yeast out of the bottle. And does it make the wine less gorgeous? It makes it, it perfects it. Is that, have you heard that before? Did you not like uh, the joke? Oh, that was, uh, fantastic, yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't get it, but that was uh, initially. But that, I, I must apologise, that's a, terrible. A good one, a good one. <laughs> we then put it onto a bottle shaker. Because we put sweet wine into it, which is slightly denser than the wine itself, we shake the bottles to make sure that the, um, the, the sugar wine, the Swiss oh, Reserve, mixes. gets mixed with the rest of it. Uh, it's quite so it's, an aggressive shake as it well. It is, it's quite, and it's an important part of the process. Yeah. If you don't do that, you get two levels of wine, and it sits there um, in the bottle, which is not obviously ideal. Yeah. We then wash the bottles. It gets washed and scrubbed. Uh, we then dry it uh, before the last part of the process, which is putting the labels on the caps, and then gets boxed. It's fantastic. I see it sliding down here towards me, meaning now it's time for us to have a taste, if that's OK. Absolutely right, yeah, down to the cellars. Brilliant. Let's go. Is it down here? So we've been in the factory, we've seen the whole process, everything right through to the bottling, and here we are, the moment of truth. I yep. think it's about time that we had a taste of this. Absolutely. Well, this is our Bacchus, and it's a really exciting wine. It's, it's fairly new for us. Um, it's a really good, and quintessentially, it's a very classic um, English still wine, but we've turned it into a sparkling. Although it's gone through the traditional champagne method, um, we, um, the wine tastes slightly different because it's slightly more... done that before. Aromatic, <laughs> it's slightly more fruity, and hopefully you'll agree, it's absolutely fantastic. It's not quite as dry as a, as a champagne, so, um, I smell as it was Cheers. Yeah, cheers. That's, that's absolutely delicious. Mm -hmm. It's really, really floral. Yeah. Slightly, slightly sweeter than champagne. Mm -hmm. Can you taste the um, elderflower in there yeah. as well? Yeah, it's really good. I think this is the perfect bottle of sparkling wine for my New Year's Eve cake. So if you don't mind, I might take this with me. You're more than welcome. Cheers, yeah, thank, cheers you. thank you. Cheers. Now, New Year, it's the time of year where everyone's letting their hair down and it's time to indulge in cake before you start your New Year's resolutions. And I'm making a delicious sparkling wine drip cake. And I'm starting off with my sponge. So in my mixer here, I've creamed some butter and sugar and a splash of vanilla till it's super fluffy. And now it's time to add some eggs. And I'm adding the eggs one by one so they don't curdle. Got some flour mixed with some baking powder to give it a nice lift. I'm just doing it slowly, one by one. And once I can see that that flour's disappeared, which is now, I'm going to stop the mixer because I don't want a chewy sponge. It's a lot of mixture. This cake is going to serve 50 to 60 people. I've got my two little ones already done. It's a large amount of batter, so I had to do two batches. And I've prepared my other tins here. You just need to level it off before it goes in the oven. So you could do the sponges the day before and just put them together on the day. Right, they're ready for the oven. I'm going to bake them on 180 degrees for about 20 to 25 minutes. Now, you might find the small ones cook a bit quicker. These will probably need another five. So while they're baking, it's time to make the syrup. Into my pan, I'm pouring almost a whole bottle of sparkling wine. It's getting me in the party spirit. So I've got a low heat. I'm going to add some sugar. This is that fizz. And I'm going to reduce it down so I've got about two thirds of the volume. And what that's going to do is make it really syrupy and intensify, 
intense to fly. <laughs> I've not even had any yet. It's going to make it really syrupy and intensify that sparkling wine taste. And when I soak it onto the sponges, oh, add a little bit of berry. It's like a giant cocktail in a cake. It's delicious, trust me. That's looking nice and thick and syrupy. I'll leave it aside to cool while I get on. So I'm busy making my buttercream. And in my mixer, I've got some butter, which I've creamed, and I'm adding double the quantity of icing sugar. And yes, there is a lot of buttercream in here, because I've got a lot of sponges to layer. And I've got them all ready. So over here, I've trimmed off the humps of the sponges I've baked earlier, and I've also split them. So it's given me four layers for each tier. So I'm going to beat this on high for about a minute till it's nice and fluffy. I'm going to add some of the sparkling wine syrup to this, just a couple of tablespoons to taste. So that's done. Right, let the New Year's Eve cake construction commence. So I've got my turntable here. If you don't have one, just have some greaseproof paper. So the first thing to do is add layer one. Have a look here. What I've done is I've just made a little nick in the whole sponge. You'll see why it's a clever idea. My dad invented this. He's an engineer and he comes up with very good ideas, as well as being a bit annoying. But this was a brilliant idea. It's like a cakey jigsaw. And just place it on here like that. And I'm just going to add lashings and lashings of sparkling wine syrup. Buttercream layer one. So I now need to attach this sponge to here. And this needs to go on like this and line up. Doing this means your sponges will be lined up exactly as they were before I cut them in half, so it will keep everything nice and level. Before I do that, I'm going to add my jam. I can see where my guideline is. Be quick and confident. Bosh. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is just move it across so that, that lines up. So we're just going to repeat and repeat and repeat. Right, ready for flipping action. Flipping, love doing this. Ready and bosh. Splashing of syrup all over that. So now you're going to notice I'm going to flip it over and the part that was in the tin is uppermost and that is because it's much smoother, it's flatter, so it's going to be neater. <laughs> I'm creating a buttercream avalanche over the side and now I'm going to start working on the sides. like polyfiller really <laughs> just to get it really neat I'm gonna use my trusty side scraper so with this it's all about the angles hold it nice and straight close to the cake and using that baseboard as a guide and when you're ready steady go all right so that's done I'm gonna pop it in the fridge to chill and then I'm gonna repeat the entire thing again on my top tier and when they're both refrigerated it's time to do the second coat I've been very busy and I've already added a special second coat to my big sponge. And it's not just any special second coat, it's New Year's Eve. This has got a special effect called a watercolour effect. And I've made a pink watercolour effect just by taking some of the buttercream and I've coloured it with the sieved jam to give it a nice light pink shade. So now I'll do the same thing for my little sponge. So now for the colour. Just go splat, 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 splat. <laughs> That's the technical term. Now, wasn't that easy? And in one, like this. Ta-da! Right, 
both of these cakes are watercolored. They're looking brilliant, but I'm afraid they have to go back in the fridge first. So minimum half an hour, but you could do it the day before if you wanted. So back in the fridge they go. My cakes are both chilled down. And now it's time to construct the cake and bring it together. So the first thing I need to do is dowel the cake so it doesn't collapse. These are cake dowels, they're hollow tubes, and you just need to push them in in a smaller circumference than the tier that's going on top of it. If it's only a small cake, so four's gonna be plenty. Mark the point where they're leaving the cake. So I've got an edible ink pen. You can get these in every color. And I'm just going to make a little mark on these dowels here. So now I'm just gonna take them out and I'm just gonna cut it. And they need to go back into the cake. Now it's time to stack it. That's satisfying, it pops off. And then just gently pop it down. Well, I just want to fill this with buttercream. And now, as you can see, where I've added the top tier, there's a gap. So you can just fill that with buttercream before you start doing the drip. Oh, it's heavy. So now it's gonna be nice and easy for me to do my drips and add all the lovely decoration. I've got some white chocolate here, which I've just melted. Just get a small amount. And what I'm doing is just going around the edge and just letting it drop. Some will be short, some will be long. How cool is that? So that's my top drippage done. I'm gonna do this one now. There, so that's all of the edges done. And now all I need to do is just flood the sides and the top. Look at that. I've got some more melted chocolate. I just melted it, poured it onto a baking tray with some parchment on. And while it was still wet, I sprinkled it with lots of different sparkles and some freeze dried raspberries. Once that's set, I can use it and now cut it into nice spiky bits. And that's gonna give me drama on the top of my New Year's Eve cake. Aren't they pretty? So there we go. So that's standing up nicely. Look at that. So behind it, I've still got that buttercream over here. Just kind of help it attach. So that's my structure. I'm going to add on some shards around the tears. So this is edible gold leaf. It's got a mind of its own. Don't do it when there's a draft. So here goes the gold leaf. It just looks lovely on the white chocolate. It's like the crowning glory, look at this. So now for the final few decorations. So these are white chocolate sweets that I've just bought in the supermarket. And you can get plain ones, and I've actually sprayed these gold. You can get edible spray, it's brilliant. Got some pink champagne truffles. This is mimicking all those bubbles inside the sparkling wine, like it's all bubbly on the top. Little shop-bought meringues. Champagne truffle. These are tiny meringues here, just dot them about. Final little touch. Look at this. Sparkling wine drip cake. It's a stunner, right? You've got to try it and have a very happy new year. I think I've earned this. Cheers. So that's your new year all sorted. There's my espresso martini cake tails, sure to keep you dancing all night. Merrily's Parker's stunning party canapé selection. My little luxurious chocolate ganache tartlets. And to see 2019 out with a bang, my sparkling wine drip cake. Happy New Year. <laughs>